I'm Kusha Karvandi, and you're listening to ExerScribe Radio, the source for biohacking your health to reach your full potential. I created ExerScribe to provide people with a roadmap to working out. With our new workout app, you can get a custom workout program that adapts your workouts to your body type, goals, sleep quality, stress levels, and personal preferences. With live chat support, our workout app has become so comprehensive some call it a personal trainer in your pocket. Our users are seeing over 90% success rates with their goals because we take the neural approach to fitness, meaning we integrate movements and exercises that recalibrate your brain and body to prime you for rapid strength gains and fat loss. Check out the Exoscribe workout app in the iTunes App Store today. In today's podcast, I interview the CEO and founder of Training for Warriors, Martin Rooney. Martin is an internationally recognized pioneer of strength and conditioning for the martial arts. He holds a Master of Health Science and Bachelor of Physical Therapy from the Medical University of South Carolina. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Exercise Science from Furman University as well. Martin was a four-time all-conference and four-time MVP performer in track and field at Furman and a member of the United States bobsled team from 1995 to 97 and 2000. Following his exposure to MMA in the mid-1990s, Martin began training with Renzo Gracie and started training fighters shortly afterward. Since the foundation of the TFW system, Martin has traveled as far as Brazil, Finland, Mexico, Japan, Russia, England, Holland, Sweden, Thailand, Italy, Germany, Austria, and the Middle East to train, compete, and conduct seminars and help prepare world-class athletes for competition. Over the last 11 years, Martin has also developed one of the top NFL combine training programs in the country, producing the fastest athlete at the 2001, 2004, 2005, and 2006 NFL combine and the first place finishers at 10 different positions, including five all-time records. 130 athletes Martin has trained have been drafted to the NFL, including the number two pick overall, Chris Long, in 2008. Hey everyone, we're here on ExerScribe Radio with the founder and CEO of Training for Warriors, Martin Rooney. Welcome, Martin. Hey, my pleasure to be here and uh, excited to hammer out some answers on some questions that we have today. Nice. I love the energy. <laughs> <laughs> so just to get started, could you tell us a little bit about you and your background? Uh, sure. If you, you know, That might take us an hour right there. But uh, uh, hey, for everybody listening, my name is Martin Rooney. And uh, uh, over the last 20 years. I've had a, I've worn a number of different hats in the fitness industry. Uh, originally, I was a track and field athlete in college and uh, grew up in New Jersey, but went to school in South Carolina and got my exercise uh, science degree. And uh, man, fitness was something that I always was so interested in, but I think so many people convinced me that that wasn't going to be a career that would be successful. I was uh, a personal trainer starting when I was 17 with absolutely no background. I was armed pretty much with lots of uh, arms routines to take people through, but that's about all I had. And uh, but I but I just loved being in the gym. That's where I always wanted to be. And but. Uh, everybody told me, man, you should be a therapist. You should be a therapist. So I went to the Medical University of South Carolina, uh, got my degree in uh, physical therapy, and then also got my master's degree in exercise science again because that calling, it was calling me, you know, that that's what I wanted, but everybody said there was just no career in it. And remember, this is the uh, early 1990s. It was the late 80s, early 90s at this point, and fitness really wasn't as established. So uh, in a weird twist of fate, I end up becoming a member on the U.S. bobsled team. I do that for a handful of years, get even more exposure in training and fitness, living at the Olympic Training Center. But when I got done, uh, when my Olympic dream was over, I became a therapist. And uh, it's weird that I think everybody listening, maybe one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give you is don't get great at something you don't really like. <laughs> you know, like don't don't try to get great at something you don't really like. And and it's weird that I just see that pattern being repeated over and over. All these people that have jobs and they're good at what they do, but it's not what they really like. What they really like is what they do on the weekends with the money they get from the thing they got good at, but it's not really what they were supposed to do. It wasn't their calling, if you will. And uh, it took me three years to figure it out. And I just started then attending seminars like a maniac in fitness. And I just said, I got I to gotta get back to where I think I can make an impact. And uh, Bill Parisi and I got together. Uh, we started the Parisi Speed School. And now that has got almost 80 locations in uh, 30 states in the U.S. We've trained a million kids with that. And I got exposed to training athletes from all the way from six years old, all the way to the highest levels from 
Olympic medalists and Super Bowl teams to, to uh, you know, regular housewives and kids. And an offshoot of that, because I was working with so many fighters, was training for Warriors. And uh, that started 16 years ago as well, but now has really exploded where now I have uh, 200 locations around the world that are running uh, the Training for Warriors program as a license. We've got uh, over 10,000 people a day going through the training. And now it's really exposed me again that my bigger mission now is I want to really make an impact uh, you know, in the, the fitness or the mentality of, of people around the world every day. And, and it's happening because we're in 25 countries and uh, it's absolutely amazing. But what I will say is all of that stuff, it all starts because I had the courage to go after what I what I knew I believed in and what I wanted versus, versus listening to what everybody else told me to do. How so that's you... kinda, that kind of brings us up to today. <laughs> <laughs> that's an awesome, awesome story. But how did you make that transition? You know, a lot of people, I think they, the thing they struggle with is making that transition from, you know, their corporate job to doing what they want to do, like what you're doing. Well, hey, I'll say this. It wasn't easy. I'll, I'll say that like I, I was tormented. I knew in year one when I was seeing four patients an hour every hour and just staying there late at night doing paperwork. I had the worst shifts. I had the Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights. So my weekends were cut short. Sundays were a mess because I was going back to work on Monday and already had the blues for it. And even then it took years to really finally step out. And you know what it was? I just made a decision and I and I quit. <laughs> you know, and and, uh, and that – as soon as I did that, it was like jumping out of an airplane. It was the it was the hardest thing I ever to do. But now looking back, you know what's funny? My boss, who was a real mentor to me, he goes, "Oh, okay." He goes, "I, I wasn't expecting you to stay here forever. You're you know you're too talented." And, and what's funny is I was like, "What?" what, what you know, I'm thinking it was going to be this horrible experience, and man, it was going to be difficult. And instead, it was it was actually easier than what I thought. So my advice would be, "Hey, if you know what you want to do, go for it." And here's the easiest part about it. Ready? You could always go back. You know, if it doesn't work out, it's not doing what you want it to do. You can always go back to the thing you don't like if you're good at it, but don't spend your whole life never going for what you love because you're too afraid to take a chance. And that only gave me the strength to do things more often and take more action faster. And that's exactly what I'm doing now where, hey, in the last three years, I've been to 25 different countries spreading the message. I have gotten to see some of the most exciting things and worked with so many of the most interesting people. And that never happens if I don't step up for myself. So anybody listening, because I hear this story a lot, man, I have this job. I'd really like to do this. Go for it. The worst thing that can happen is it doesn't work out and you do something else. But actually, really, the worst thing that could happen is you never try and then you, you play that what if game the rest of your life. And you got to have a lot of energy like you have. Um, <laughs> you know what's funny? The more of these webinars I do, uh, I, this is just me, so I don't know what, uh, you know, meaning I, I guess I know what a low energy person is, mm -hmm. but uh, I will say this too. Hey, for everybody listening, when you do what you love and you're fired up to talk about it, you sound like you got high energy. And uh, so maybe that's how I sound right now, but it's because I found direct alignment with what I love doing. And uh, so think about it. If you, if you know somebody that just saw or their favorite football team play, they're going to talk with high energy. Or if they just saw something else that, uh, that's a hobby of theirs and, and it's the world championships, they're going to have high energy. What's your thing that gives you that energy and fires you up? And that could actually be a great question to ask yourself that could start directing you where you're really supposed to go. No, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, I've noticed the people who are most passionate and happiest with what they're doing, they have a lot of energy like you have. The ones who are kind of drained from their day jobs, uh, they have no energy. Yeah, well, and, and that's just a sign that that's not how they're productively supposed to spend their time. Hey, we're, we're human beings. We're made for action. You know, we're made to do things. We are not made, you were not put here to slog through your life, to get to be 65, to then do the stuff you think you like to do. That's an old idea. That idea is over. And it's just, but so many people I see just going through the motions every day. So if you're listening to this podcast in a car, in traffic right now, and you and you hate sitting in traffic. That should be like your sign. You should just kind of like turn your car around and go find figure out what you're supposed to be doing. And <laughs> and that's what I did. I had I had this horrible commute. I, you know what really pushed me over the edge? I had this horrible commute. I was really just. I'd always have a knot in my gut and stress when I was going to work. And then one day my radio broke, and like, and that was like the final the final straw because 
I would always listen to either motivational tapes or just something to get me through. And then I couldn't even do that anymore. And that's when I said, man, I got to get out of this situation. This is, uh, this is driving me nuts. And that was the piece that pushed me over. And man, as soon as I made the decision, everything, I haven't, I'll say this, I haven't worked a day since. And, uh, and it's now going on almost 20 years. And that's where the energy comes from. Wow. I love it. Really motivational. <laughs> that's my style. <laughs> So what's different about training for warriors than other training methodologies? And that's a great question. It's one that I get a lot recently, or, you know, and, and obviously people will ask me about different, uh, or usually the question is prefaced with, Hey, what do I think of this system or that system? And, uh, one of the things that I always say is about the other systems, I don't really think about them. Like right now, as you can see, I'm in training for warriors headquarters. I spend my time focused on what I'm doing and what our organization is doing to help people. And uh, so in terms of can I really comment about other programs? Not really because I'm not really focused on them or know what they're doing. But what I would say that I think separates training for warriors is uh, training for warriors is just not about training or, or the exercise itself. It's really about, actually, I guess you could describe it as a lifestyle where I see so many other systems, it's more like, oh yeah, it's, uh, here's our exercise or here's our tough thing to do today or here's the workout. And uh, the workout isn't really the thing that's going to get people coming in there and it's definitely not going to be the thing that changes their life outside of there. So uh, other history on myself, I'm a black belt in judo, a purple belt in jujitsu. I've been around many of the top martial artists in the world for the last couple decades. And what I tried to do is make training for warriors like a martial art, but instead of punches and kicks, use physical exercise and, and the personal development to improve them. And it's working. So, you know, we've got an army of trainers now. There's been over 3,000 people that have been through uh, my certification. And like I said, we've got 250 coaches running our program daily in 25 countries around the world. And it's making an impact with people. So for instance, yesterday I get an email and it says, Hey Martin, I just wanted to thank you. I train out of a training for warriors. I got, uh, my husband got stung by a bee and, uh, we didn't know he was allergic. He went into anaphylactic shock and he's 200 pounds, but I was able to drag him. I don't know how far she said she dragged him, but drag him so far to get him to the car, to get him to the hospital and save his life. And she said that wouldn't have been possible without the system or, uh, the story of a guy that was in a wheelchair and one of our coaches got him out of the wheelchair and he walked his first mile where they told him he would never walk again in a training for warrior shirt or people that are now taking on cancer, not just obesity, but you know, just bigger picture stuff. And I think that's my mission a whole lot more than, uh, than I care about like either how much somebody lifted or if they can beat somebody else. So that may be another big component too is, uh, my system's not, about competition. It's about people working together and, uh, and really be in a cool place where people can go and become more and not be embarrassed. And I think fitness today, we do have some challenges where fitness is scary for a lot of people and, uh, and fitness is also uh, potentially injuring people as well. And as long as that kind of stuff continues to happen, that hurts everybody in the industry. So I think training for warriors, again, what separates it is I'm trying to look out for the whole industry by creating something that people can believe in that has good uh, motives and mantras from the beginning, uh, maybe not making up the rules as I go. And, you know, I, I hope that's, you know, a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> so do you guys, with your system, do you guys cover nutrition as well? Yep. So in the system, obviously, I don't know how you couldn't cover it and have a successful system where... Uh, every session, there is a portion de dedicated to nutrition. And, and I've been lucky to be around some of the best guys in the world. John Berardi helped uh, create the framework for our uh, nutritional philosophy. And I think, I think everybody has to have that. Like every system's got, hopefully, its philosophy on nutrition. But what I would say is I think the difference about Training for Warriors, again, is, hey, anybody can communicate calories or talk about foods but not everybody can get people to do it. And uh, that's the code that I'm trying to crack. So I'm, I'm trying to get people, people don't eat when they're in your session. They eat when they're not with you. People aren't buying the food when they're in your session. It's when they're not around you. And uh, so what I try to do is create uh, impactful trigger messages that will change the people's behavior when they're not with me too. And uh, hey, you know, we're 16 years deep into the development of this system. And I, you know, I've spent, uh, 
countless amounts of time and money to, to develop this thing the best I can, but it's always evolving as well. So, but that's where we're currently at. So yes, there is a nutritional component. I've gotten people that have forgotten more about nutrition than I'll ever learn to help build it for me because, uh, that is not, you know, that's, I, you know, I think I'm pretty well schooled in nutrition, but I even want better. And then it's really though in the delivery process of how that's delivered to the individual person where the rubber meets the road on how you get results. Nice. What about this whole concept of functional training and functional fitness? There seem to be some growing buzzwords, uh, but it also seems well, that some trainers are kind of taking that too far. What are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, if, if you've ever seen any of my work, I've got some uh, funny videos tongue in cheek over the years that I've done uh, in, I guess, battle. But remember, what we're talking about here is semantics. There's so many words in fitness that just get made up or help to define a genre. I mean, I don't think even the best people can define it well. You know, the expert, a good friend of mine, Mike Boyle, he'd be, you know, he's a guy that I've seen him lecture on it and it really makes sense when he does, but he's a makes sense guy versus uh, some of, like you said, some of the things where whenever anything new comes out, it can go crazy. Just like, hey, what do we think about metabolic training and what's happening today and how people are getting beat down in boot camps or anything? You know, there's, you know, what happens is an, a concept comes out and then perhaps it goes too far. So, what I would say is, hey, if you want to know what's functional, can you pick something heavy off the floor? Can you run really fast somewhere if your kid was in the street and a car is coming? So, you know, and that's, uh, I believe that my system prepares people for daily life. If we want to say really that's what functional is, that's how I got taught when I was a therapist. But I think, unfortunately, when people start uh, just making up exercises just to seem creative or, or uh, without a really without a real concern of getting a result or actually if it works that's where we run into trouble and that's again another part of my message that I'm trying to get out there to really get people to ask the questions of why they're doing what they're doing but also to bring them back to remind everybody in fitness that your real job is to get results your job is not your job is not to be super cool or have the latest fancy crazy thing that doesn't work and then people don't come and and then they tell everybody fitness doesn't work our job is to connect, engage, and get people to do this stuff and hopefully use the best economical choices of exercises you can to get a result. But overall, hey, I'm not going to poo-poo the word functional training or whatever else. I know what it, I guess, means to me, but at the same time, sometimes people, yeah, like you were hinting at, people can take things too far. Exactly. What about some of your books? Tell me about that. Tell me uh, about Training for Warriors, the book. What's that about? Uh um, well, a number of years ago, I started, well, actually, yeah, 16 years ago, I started writing for different magazines, ranging from Gracie Magazine when I started to Men's Health, Men's Fitness, a lot of the, you know, the, considered some of the top magazines in the world for fitness. And uh, these articles eventually became a self-published book that I did. And then, uh, then because of the success of that self-published book, Training for Warriors, uh, I got a real book deal with HarperCollins Publishing House in New York City. And I did the first book called uh, Training for Warriors. Now, that book was more specifically designed toward, I guess, the it was a vehicle to get training across, but it was more, it used the, the concept of fighting or fighters, which could sometimes scare people away. But what I would tell people is if you really look at the training and you just take out the photos of fighters, it's not about fighting, it's about everyone. But remember, that book, I wrote that starting in, I guess, 2005, 2006, so it's almost a decade ago uh, in it, how Training for Warriors has evolved. The second book I did was called Ultimate Warrior Workouts, where they sent me all over the world to examine training in different countries of the world, which was a, probably one of the highlight experiences of my life. And then uh, I did a book uh, a couple of years ago called Warrior Cardio. And that book now transitioned to the Training for Warriors system isn't just for fighters, it's for everyone. And that book has exploded because it really identifies the bigger concepts of uh, warm-ups, evaluations, metabolic training, and really trying to make sense of it, where that's where John Berardi wrote the nutrition section. My old professors wrote the, the uh, I guess you could say, scientific portion behind why this style of training works. And I really tried to just get a book out there that started to ask the questions about some of these movements that were happening. And uh, so those, those are the three books that, you know, anybody can find those on Amazon. And, you know, each one's like 300 to 400 pages and took three plus years of my life each time. But, uh, 
you know, definitely, I think there's some great information. And all told, between the three of those, I think there's almost 1,200 total pages and probably 1,000 exercises and a year's worth of workouts. So, you know, it was, uh, I poured my brain into a lot of that stuff. <laughs> nice. What's uh, Success Patterns? What's that all about? Success Patterns was a book, uh, you know, Bill Preecy and I, when we were uh, putting the Preecy Speed School together, you know, Bill was this, you know, he just is such a savvy business guy and, and the way that he gets things done and the combination of him and myself with the training knowledge and, and, and it was, uh, we really, with the right reasons, launched this thing and changed the sports performance industry. You know, for instance, now, you know, 20 years later, I see so many facilities that are called sports performance. They got a piece of turf. They got some track. But in the, you know, in the early 1990s, we were the, you know, we were the guys pioneering this stuff. And uh, I wanted to document that and write a book about his life, but the business principles behind how he did what he did. And that took me about a year to do. And it was a really, really fun project. So that book is, it's a business book. A business book you could say about fitness, but really a business book about anything in business. But it's but it also chronicles our journey and how he did what he did. But there are some really cool lessons in there that people could benefit from. I don't care what industry you're in. So that one total different uh, spin for me from you know. So there's nothing really per se about fitness or working out, but it really features my motivational style and and I guess business acumen in that one. Nice. I've also noticed on your site you've trained hundreds of athletes that have been drafted. You know what's the secret behind that? <laughs> well, you know it's funny. The, the, some of these are classic questions that I I always used to hear. Like, uh, so hey, so for people listening, another part of my history was I uh, we had one of the early successful NFL Combine programs. So I've sent you know 150 guys drafted to the league. I've had the fastest guy at the NFL Combine in multiple different years and I've got some of the fastest all-time scores in many of the events and uh, and some of those will probably never be broken because the surface is now different. So it was a very big aspect of what I did and what I prided myself on to prove that the if I could prove that the system could work with the best athletes in the world, what could it do for, you know, regular Joes and Janes. And uh, but that program uh, was it was very high pressure. You would get athletes for a period of time out of the year and you had to prep them for the biggest job interview they would ever have in their life. So mentally, emotionally, physically, you know, down to every meal they ate, you know, every, you know, thought they had in their head, you wanted to try to make sure that they were putting their best foot forward. And, uh, you know, we had incredible, incredible success with that. And I, I and, you know, now I'm no longer doing that because, as I said, I want to try to make a bigger impact than than a handful of NFL guys a year. But uh, that was a really, really cool experience, which also led me. I was a speed coach for the uh, New York Giants. I was a hand fighting specialist for the New York Jets for a bunch of years. And uh, so football also played a role in what I did. That's why I said when you asked for my story, now, hey, in 20 years, you can do a lot of stuff. And it's kind of like I can't fit them all in, but at least we're getting it out. But Hopefully for the listener, you're probably not saying, wait a minute, now he did this too? This can't be real. But hey, you spend, <laughs> you spend 10 years on stuff, you can get a lot of things done. And this, this interview is now reminding me of that, that I'm old. Holy man. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you said you had your degree in physical therapy, you were practicing that. Do you see any flaws in that education system? I mean, do you use a lot of what you learned in school today? Um, here's what I would say. I love education. So I will never say, don't go get a degree or don't learn because it's what you get out of it. I, I considered myself a very serious student. So I really dove into the information regardless of what, whether I was interested or not. I was there to learn, to try to be the best I could be. Hey, you can also go to a university and get nothing out of it and have wasted your money and say you didn't learn anything. But my understanding of anatomy, biomechanics, physiology, pathophysiology, neuroanatomy, these are all things. And your, my ability to connect with patients interview them, evaluate, I think is incredibly valuable to the fitness industry or for what I got. And I would never change a bit of that. I think the tragic flaw in education, uh, maybe at the undergraduate level, is there's not enough practical approach. For instance, you can get a degree in exercise physiology and not ever once learn a thing about training or, or people. So what I would say is I think 
that if there was a better practical component where people really got maybe more into the real world, because hey, yeah, I did internships, you go somewhere for a month, and what do you do? You stand around and you don't really learn much, or even when you work, I don't know if that's enough either. So what it is, is education prepares you with knowledge that hopefully you can draw upon when you're out there in the real world, but, uh, but I would never say don't go get it, but at the same time, just because you have a degree doesn't mean you're done, where my real education has continued for the last 20 years, and my bookshelf of a thousand books on it, uh, that is my university now and, and how I've become who I've become. So I would say, hey, the degree shows you can finish through. It shows you have a passion. If you end up around great teachers, you're going to learn some really valuable stuff. But at the same time, that education has to continue and move forward. But I think uh, educational systems like universities and different things, perhaps there should be less focus on the Krebs cycle and mitochondrial density than there is on how to handle people, how to coach, and, and you know move ahead with the times into what's really going on in training too. And if those were met, man, it would, uh, it would only help and enhance our industry. Nice. Where do you get a lot of your information from then? How do you stay on the cutting edge? Uh, I'm a, a, an avid reader. So for instance, I, you know, you, what you don't see is I'm buried in books right here. So I read a, you know, probably two or three books a week. And, uh, but I have, uh, trained myself and honed my skills to be able to do that. So, you know, one, I learn a lot from reading. Uh, number two, I have a really pretty vast network of some really interesting people. You know, some of my best friends range from world champions and silver medalists in the Olympics to doctors that travel the world performing uh, free surgeries on people that need it to top sports psychologists and professional coaches. So these are the people that I spend a lot of time also exchanging ideas. So I think your network and who you who you build into your network or your close circle of friends is also very, very important. And then, hey, I'm also a student, so I'm presenting around the world all the time. But when I'm presenting, there are other people presenting too. And I always go to stay sharp, you know, so to see what everybody else is talking about and, uh, and always learn new things. So I, for instance, this I'll show you right here. I carry a book with me at all times. And in that book is all the really cool ideas that I pick up you know, as you can see here, you know, the cool ideas that I pick up every day. And uh, I have 20 of these books filled. So when people ask me what are my most important books, it's uh, the ones that I've filled with the stuff that I've learned so I can go back and draw upon that. So, you know, if anything, guys, if you just heard some of the stuff I said, hopefully you agree. You, now you do say, whoa, that dude is a serious student. So, you know, if anybody's saying, because I get this question a lot too, hey, how do you do it? How do I get to be in your shoes? How do I get to do what you do? Well, it's 20 years of killing yourself and, uh, and trying to be your best every single minute. And uh, when you do that often enough and long enough, something really cool is going to happen. And stuff really cool has happened along this way, uh, you know, for me. Are there any books in particular you would recommend the audience read? <laughs> now, I, I also get that question a lot. And I think, hey, let me give you a little philosophy, on, my philosophy on books. For everybody listening, a book is an investment in your time depending how well you read, how well you comprehend, and how you've selected that book to make sure that's the book you need at the exact right time uh, for you and says the right thing and, and, and that you're at the right place to receive that information, a book can be really difficult. And that's why I always am hesitant to start making recommendations because I could recommend the book for you right now that it maybe is what I'm reading right now that you might say, man, I pulled that and that's horrible. I, I, I'm not getting anywhere with that. That makes no sense. But 20 years from now, you might read it. And that might be the one that changes your life. But uh, you know, but there are some that I could say are just you know you can't lose. And, and but they're in different realms maybe than you would think. So I would say, hey, think and grow rich. Napoleon Hill. It'll change how you think about money. Uh, richest man in Babylon. Read it. It'll take you two hours, and it'll teach you how to save money and put money away. Which if you never do that, what are you working for? Uh, how to win friends and influence people. Probably one of the most all-time classics by Carnegie. That uh, if you know, even though it was written so long ago, you could probably buy it. I guarantee. You, go to Amazon. You'll find it used for less than a dollar, and uh, and I guarantee you got more than a dollar's worth of information in there. And hey, I would start there. You start with those three: how to how to save your money, how to think about money, and how to handle people. If you mastered those three books, your life would change instantly and you didn't even read a thing about training. So those three I can say with confidence, no matter where you are, you'll get something out of. But those books 
will lead you to the next book. So once you're reading it, don't go buy 20 books, buy one book, and then where does that book take you? Maybe in the back there's a bibliography. Maybe during that book it said, hey, also read this book. And that leads you on this path of discovery that has been very exciting for me that uh, now so many books on the shelf, it's, uh, you really see you become a product of all those books. Awesome. No, great recommendations. So, you know, with, uh, with your lifestyle, what, is, uh, what does it look like on a daily basis in terms of exercise and nutrition? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I was, I was going to make a joke, say, yeah, I never work out, I don't eat right, but, that, you know, could be, uh, hey, my day, uh, I have four daughters, so for everybody listening, I have four daughters, and I got a wife, you know, so I am a pretty busy guy, so now I get up pretty early with the kids and take them to school, but at least it gets my day going. Uh, I set aside time because I have a, uh, an extreme amount of emails from all different accounts where everybody should be, you know, should know by now between your multiple Facebooks, your Twitter, your Instagram, your different email accounts, your LinkedIn, your, you know, holy cow, there's so much information coming to me. So what I'll do is I'll set aside an hour and I get through it. If I don't get through it, I leave it alone. I don't continue to waste my day or move on. Then I will go to the gym or, uh, you know, or, you know, go and teach classes depending on what's going on. So I'm either teaching or I'm working out or switching that order because I always want to still stay sharp and make sure that my system is doing what it's doing. Uh, then I will return and it'll either be reading or creating material for my network because these are parts of my job now too. So I deliver all the daily uh, stories, daily workouts, daily nutritional information every day for the training for the entire year of the people that are in our affiliate network. So we constantly have uh, information that I have to release to them on a daily basis. So that now with you know 200 locations uh, absorbs a lot of my time as well. And then uh, throughout the day, depending on what comes up next, I might be traveling for speaking or I might have uh, interviews like this that I'll uh, periodically set up through the week. And then, uh, and then throughout the day, I'm making sure I'm eating well and that I also get enough sleep. So one thing I'll challenge everybody out there, you're going to learn about me, guys. Uh, I, li I, I, have, I like to have a saying. I say I'm one of the strongest guys I know. So I, I train hard. I eat right. I get enough sleep, and I work my tail off. And uh, you do that, again, for – yeah, so what I always say, <laughs> you want to be successful, work half the day. You pick which half, first half and second half. But you better be doing 12 hours, You know, meaning you don't have to. I know, oh, yeah four-hour work week or whatever else, but I would be bored if I only had four hours of stuff to do. So I like really uh, you know, getting a lot done and uh, checking boxes. So for instance, right here, guys, here is my list today that I have to complete, and uh, which is sitting right next to my calendars and what I've got to get done. And by the end of the day, when that is all checked off, I'm going to feel awesome. And one of them I got to check off is this uh, interview, which will be one of the things that gets checked off right now. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> So, I'm brain dumping on everybody right now. <laughs> you know, people right now, if your head is spinning, hey, don't worry. You can listen to this thing again and take it down slow. I'm trying to trying to give you as much as I can. That's my style in a short period of time. So if you feel like you're drinking out of a fire hose right now, I apologize. But I'm trying to give you as much as I got. No, it's excellent. It's really, really good information. Uh, with your business, what would you say some of the biggest obstacles or the biggest hurdles that you had to overcome were? Hmm. Biggest obstacles. Um, I, well, biggest obstacle in the beginning was it's uh, creating an awareness of what we were. I mean, obviously, the title "Training for Warriors" could be could potentially be scary to people, or people not understand, or say, "Oh, that's not for me. I'm not a fighter." And uh, but I always knew, hey, what does the word "apple" mean, right? What What does "apple" mean to you? Yeah, it's a fruit. You know, well, but see, most oh, people yeah. wouldn't say fruit. Most oh, people would say it's my phone or it's my oh, computer yeah. or it's my watch. Yeah, the brand so recognition. So you can make – it's your job to brand it. But I think in the beginning, the hardest thing was is to get the public to have confidence in it. So you want to say what's the biggest obstacle? When you're selling a license, the biggest obstacle is selling the first one. So you know, you know, who was it going to be that somebody was going to say, you know what, I believe in this guy and this program and I want to go for it. And, uh, and it was hard. You know, and remember, it took us a year – to get 11 people on board. And then in the second year, we only had 30. And now we have two, you know, and then the third year we had over 100. And now this year we've done 100 more. So it's kind of like, do you see how now people aren't afraid anymore and they get it? 
Mm-hmm. And they understand, wow, this program is so cool and it's for everybody. And it's in such an incredible value for what we get for what it is. And that's what I wanted to create. But I think the biggest obstacle was overcoming that stigma, but also getting people uh, on board to believe in it. Same thing with my certifications. I had, you know, my first few certifications, we couldn't get 10 people where now we close them out at 40 or 50 people. And there's usually a 20 person waiting list. And that's been for two years straight anywhere in the world where we hold it. But it took again for everybody listening, it takes hard work. Like you got to you got to do such a great job at those events when there's nobody to ever get a lot of people. And I think that was, if I had to say, what was my biggest obstacle? It was that creating awareness, notoriety, and uh, trust or belief in other people that it was going to be a good thing. And, and now that I have done some of that, now the, the ball is starting to roll. Nice. That's great. So really good information today. But what's one simple thing you would recommend our listeners start with uh, today to improve their health and fitness? Hmm. Well, here's what I would say. It's simplest thing for everybody listening. Are you listening? <laughs> you know what to do. You know how to eat, right? You know how many hours of sleep you need, right? Watch. How many hours of sleep you need? You know, if you're in your car, you're on your phone, you're <laughs> going to say eight, eight, eight. You know how to eat right. You know exercise is important. You know how much sleep to get. The key is not knowing it. The key is doing something about it. So the world is not reserved for the person with information. The world is reserved for the person that takes action on that information. So what's the one thing you could do? Hey, put down the candy bar and get an apple. What's the one thing you could do? Get an extra 45 minutes of sleep tonight. What's the one thing you could do? Just go exercise. I don't care what it is, but do something. And turn those somethings into a habit and your life will change. But if you just continue to dive deeper into gluten-free and, well, you know, uh, what about this? And I read that and you never do anything about it. It's not valuable. So that would be my biggest piece of advice is, hey, you know what to do, guys. Now do it. And when you do it, it works. And if you do it, you're going to get somebody else to do it. And uh, that's what I've been trying to do every day. Awesome. Really good uh, <laughs> information today. I, lo- I love the stories and, uh, and I love the insights. I want to thank you again for being on our on our podcast, Exoscribe Radio, today. Thank you, Martin. Hey, my pleasure. And if anybody's uh, interested, hey, check out my blog at trainingforwarriors.com. Uh, Got some great information there. And uh, hey, always write me, you know, online or Facebook or whatever if if this inspired you or whatever else, because that's the kind of stuff I love hearing that helps me uh, be more inspired when I do things like this, because I know it has an effect. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, great work today, and, uh, and I'll talk to you soon. Great. Thanks again. If you haven't already, get your custom workout program by downloading the Exerscribe app from the iTunes App Store today. Mm-hmm.